All right. So there's one other thing I want to introduce. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> and, oh, maybe, maybe he's being shy. <laughs> oh, no, oh, here he comes. <laughs> <laughs> This is Wug. <laughs> this walking animation is currently a work in progress. Uh, uh, Callan, uh, Reimer back there, he actually modeled it and uh, who drew it? What's her name? Kendall. And yeah, she doesn't look here anymore. But maybe she'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, say hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, before I get started, how many of you have actually opened up Unity and done something in the tool? Show of hands. Okay, how many people have actually built a game with Unity? Awesome. All right, so we're gonna start by answering the question, what is Unity? For those people that have kind of heard about it but don't actually know exactly what it is. Sweet transition. Uh, it's both <laughs> an editor and uh, a game engine. So a lot of people think it's either one or the other, but it's actually both. It's the tool you use to build your games and content and the engine that runs your games. So I'm gonna try something a little different for this presentation, something I haven't seen before. I'm gonna try to give a first person perspective presentation. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Uh, <laughs> nice log. Here's my presentation. Okay, let's, let's try this here. So what makes... <laughs> 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 All right, so what makes Unity great? So I was thinking to answer this question, and I was just like, okay, I'm just going to pick some of the things that I really love about Unity and kind of show them off here. So the first thing I really love about Unity is physics. And physics in Unity is so helpful that even if you're like, my game is a 2D game and it doesn't actually have any physics, you will still use the physics engine uh, because it does so many helpful things like colliders and things like that, that it saves so much time. I come from a flash background and actually spent a, uh, a lot of my time writing 3D physics engines and it's amazing to jump into Unity and just have it work. So for example, just it works, this took like two seconds to whip up. Alright, so we're going to continue on our quest. Alright. <laughs> uh, go through here. And go over here. So the next thing is lighting. Uh, so you can see here, this area is lit. And you can see that there's light shafts. And you can see on the wall here, up here, you can see that there's a little bit of a light, uh, lighter area than over here from those lights. Uh, this lighting is all what we call baked. So they set up all the lights in the scene and then they used Beast, which is a built-in lighting engine, to actually bake all those lights onto the surfaces so this can actually run on a mobile device. But Unity also supports real-time lighting. And let's carry on here. All right, go outside here. Next one I want to talk about is particles. Uh, this is a particle effect. Uh, this smoke coming out of these exhaust ports here. Uh, particles are incredibly powerful in Unity, and with the new upcoming release, they're even going to get more powerful. Uh, you can do just crazy things with them uh, with a low overhead when it comes to performance. Shaders. Uh, so for people that don't know what a shader is, Shader is uh, just the language that tells the graphics card what to render. So, for example, uh, over here we have uh, this uh, metal beam here. Uh, there's just a shader that tells uh, the graphics card to take a texture, just an image, and how to apply it onto that. So every time you have a 3D mesh and it has a uh, texture on it, that like you can see something, a shader is writing that. And so the reason I put shaders here, I wanted to show you something a little more advanced, is if you can see here on the wall, it kind of looks teeny, and as you move around, it does different things. That's just a shader. And shaders are incredibly powerful. And confusing. And confusing, yes, very confusing. <laughs> but it's all right, because lots of smart people have already wrote lots of shaders yeah. for yeah. you, so. <laughs> yeah. 
I think the most important thing uh, about Unity and what makes it the most great is that it is so easy to use. It has a great editor. Uh, Alec will go in and kind of show you how to use this editor, uh, but it is amazing. Uh, coming from, I've dealt with a lot of other game engines and also coming from Flash, where you almost have nothing to work with, having something so powerful is shocking. It actually took me a long time to realize that I should be using this editor because it is powerful, because I came from the background of avoid editors, they're for people that don't know what they're doing. Uh, in Unity, it's if you know what you're doing, you're using the editor. Uh, the next thing is a uh, wonderful asset pipeline. So this means it is easy to take 3D models, say at a Maya, Max, Blender, and drop them into your project and magically have your meshes populate in your uh, project. And then when you make changes to that Blender file, they automatically come through. Same thing with uh, graphics. For example, if you're editing your textures in Photoshop and you just want to drop the PSD in the project, uh, Unity will take that for you and convert it to uh, an image format for you. You don't have to go through that extra step of uh, exporting if you don't want to. Uh, the next uh, bullet there is C Sharp for programming. Uh, I love C Sharp. It is by far my favorite language. I programmed in a lot of languages, but it is hand. It is so much better than everything that I currently use, and it is great to be able to use it to make games. You don't have to go into something complex like C++ or deal with some of the uh, limited feature sets that come with Flash, like ActionScript 3. Uh, robust feature set. So by this I mean Unity has a lot of features built into it, as I mentioned before. Things like Beast Lighting, uh, the uh, NVIDIA PhysX engine, and all these different things that normally would be out of the reach of an independent or beginner developer are literally at your fingertips. And that's all great, but that is not helpful if it's out of reach cost-wise. That's another reason why Unity rocks, is Unity, the regular version, is free. And not only is it free, you can actually build games and release them and don't have to pay a dime. This is completely different than almost every other game engine. Uh, and then if you want to do other things like publish out to iOS for iPad or iPhone or Android, uh, then there's just a, a, a low cost to be able to acquire these add-ons. And you can just do them at a later date. So say you're like, oh, John, I'm interested in building some iPhone game. You can start building it in Unity and make your game and then go, you know what, I, I think this is going to be it. And then go and buy that add-on later. Because Unity is set up in such a way that it's designed to build once and to go everywhere. I think you can try the add-ons for free too for like a month. Oh yeah, that, that is true. I think with the There's with the first trial for, for thirty days. For thirty days. All right. Now it has lots of supported platforms. This is definitely one of the things that sets it apart from everything. Uh, the platforms are here, a PC, Mac as a standalone application. There is a web player uh, that people can download and uh, play your content in the web, the same stuff that you built for PC and Mac. Uh, iOS for iPad, iPhone, Android, uh, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Wii, and coming soon, the actual Flash Player. So the new version of Flash Player, Flash Player 11, has a new feature called Stage 3D, which uh, supports hardware accelerated graphics. And the Unity team has actually wrote an exporter that is coming out soon that will actually take your Unity content and convert it into a format the Flash Player will understand. So uh, I spend a lot of my time building web player content in Unity. And it's great because it's, it's, it's powerful and you can get that PC Mac experience in a web browser, but the problem is sometimes penetration rate. So it's the amount of people that have that web player on their computer. And sometimes you end up having drop off, for example, if uh, 10 people go to the site, maybe only five actually have the player or download it, and the other 50% uh, leave. And that's not so great if you want a large uh, demographic. But when it comes to Flash Player, it's on 98% of computers. So you kind of sidestep that whole thing and you can get your content out to everyone. And as I mentioned before, the content you write for PC and Mac will work on uh, 
in the web player, and then that stuff will also work on iOS. Uh, let's see if I can get lost. <laughs> all right. Through here. So those things are all well and good, but if it's not something that many people use, or it hasn't been demonstrated to be used successfully, it's not that much, that's not that good. But it is a proven tool, right down from the individuals right up to large studios. So I'm just going to show a couple examples of people that have used, people and companies that have used this tool successfully. So we'll start with some small teams. Zombieville USA uh, for iOS. So this game was developed by uh, two people. Uh, they were animation majors, uh, so they didn't have a strong programming background at all. And they were able to take Unity and build this 2D side-scrolling zombie shoot-em-up game that today has sold over a million units on iOS. And the sequel, Zombieville USA 2, has very recently came out. And I think when I checked today, it was number 23 of the paid apps on iOS. Skeetball. Uh, this is one of the first games, Unity games, that I played on iOS and it was one of the first big success stories. It ended up being the number one paid app in, on iOS for five weeks straight. So that's pretty successful. <laughs> <laughs> Snuggle truck. Uh, so this game is for iOS, PC, and Mac, and it also has a web demo. Uh, this was developed by two of my friends in Boston, and I actually had the privilege to do a little bit of work on this game. Uh, last week, it actually participated in Free Appa Day, so it went free, and in that seven day period, it, it moved 1.2 million units, which is unfathomable to me. So, that's all well and good. But let's talk about large studios. So there is a lot of larger companies working with Unity. For example, EA has actually signed an agreement with Unity that they're going to develop a whole bunch of their new games using the Unity engine. Because they've realized that it is an incredibly powerful tool. So a couple of them, I just want to list here, is uh, Shadowgun uh, for iOS. I think there might be an Android version now. Uh, it is a Gears of War style game. Definitely go check it out. Uh, a screenshot doesn't do it justice. You have to actually see it in motion. Uh, it, it's very impressive that you're able to turn out those kind of graphics on uh, an iPhone 3GS and an iPad. Um, Tiger Woods, uh, PGA Tour Online, that's an EA game. Uh, it's in the web browser. Uh, EA's goal with that game was to take uh, make a game like the Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3 version that you could play in your browser, and it's amazing what they've been able to accomplish. Battlestar Galactica Online, uh, a lot more people have heard of this one. This is an MMO. Uh, it is fairly, uh, fairly huge. I don't know what their download numbers are at, at right now, but it's been pretty successful, and it is very impressive what they've been able to do in the web browser. And lastly, I want to mention Richard. Uh, this is a PS3 exclusive game uh, that just came out. It was the very first PS3 game using Unity. So lastly, Unity has a great community. Uh, it has, there's lots of tutorials, examples, and people willing to help. Uh, it is not a small group of people. Uh, for example, when I started with Unity, I was number 12,000 of the people that actually used Unity Editor. Right now, there's over 700,000 people using the Unity Engine. And that means that there's a lot of people from small companies to individuals to large companies making examples. Uh, Twitter is incredibly active in the Unity group. They have amazing forums and answers. So it is super easy to pick up and learn from that perspective. All right. That concludes my part of the presentation. So, move on over to Alec here. So.
if I missed the last part. Oh, maybe the last part. I was going to show everybody that I didn't do all those models myself. You didn't? I didn't. Why? I know. So, the uh, for people that uh, haven't actually opened up Unity and looked at the main project, that was actually the main project that you get when you download Unity for the first time. It's a game called Angry Bots, and you're free to use the content in it. And so I took that, and it is, I'll just play it here just so you can kind of get an understanding of what the game is like. Up in the island demo no, this is this is this, this, is, this is shiny and new. So it runs on every single platform. See, yeah, this oh. is iOS. Yeah, PC. Max. I'm using a ton of tricks to do all the reflections and stuff, so it can run perfectly fine on like an iPhone. Insane, anyway. Like there's, I think zero real time lights. Yeah, it's all <laughs> baked. Well, and baked, baked means that stuff's like rendered out as a texture and slapped onto the surface. So what I did was, in just a couple days, I just took this and converted it to a first-person perspective uh, game and then built my presentation in it. And it was actually fairly easy to do. Is and this, uh, is this, sorry, is this, is this done in Unity Pro or is this the free version? This is free. This is free. This is the free version. Oh, yeah. okay. Everything in here you can do for free. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah. And that's that. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and now an awkward transition. <laughs> <laughs> While we're awkwardly transitioning, everyone has one of these. And does everyone have project files? So you can download it. That's a problem. Oh, okay. So there's. Wait, I got it. USB stick. Yeah. Project or you had a problem with it, or you don't have a laptop. If you can find somebody else who has it, just so you can uh, follow along and maybe share in the wonderful experience. Um, and if you want to load up the tutorial scene, because that's the first one we're going to look at. Basically, what's on these sheets? Uh, this is kind of just backup material. I'm going to be going over most of this stuff, but this is kind of like a cheat sheet. You can reference it to learn about some shortcuts that you can do. Um, some of the stuff that you're going to do is also outlined on the second page, so if you get really confused about what I'm talking about, uh, feel free to ask me a question anytime. Don't be nervous about interrupting my stupid presentation. Um, but you can also refer to these if you want. I'm just going to do a really, really quick intro here. Kurt, do you know how to full screen it? Uh, just hit play. Where is the upper yeah, there? Is. is this one done in Unity too? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can export to Keynote. <laughs> it's absolutely pointless. <laughs> Actually, I remember somebody made a game in Excel somehow. <laughs> I don't know how they, anyway. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about making games with Unity. I'm going to kind of get I'm gonna <coughs> slightly veering off topic into something that I'm more excited by and then come back to Earth and we'll actually go into the nuts and bolts of things. Um, because I'm super excited about games. And why am I excited about games? Is it because they make more money than films? No. Um, <laughs> well, but it's, it's a medium where you can do everything at once. And so if you're a person that likes doing any of these things, and there's more, and there's going to be more things being added all the time. Um, 
this is where you want to be. And the cool thing about a group like this is we can have people with all different kinds of skills and abilities, and we should be able to collaborate on a variety of different projects. <laughs> Um, so that's why I'm excited about this. I'm excited about how all these different things interact, right? And up until now, we haven't had really good tools for seeing all those things at the same time and manipulating them. Like, it's not like if you're a painter and you could just paint something. It's like you have to go over to the programmer, he has to write a bunch of code and put it into a compiler and then send it over here. It's all these sort of separate, discrete steps. Um, but this is an amazing time to be making games because we're just starting to get tools that kind of can let us treat things uh, a bit more fluently. So this kind of talks to the idea of flow. When you when you get into a workflow, you're kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm going to add this model into the here. I'm going to write a script for this player to move around. I'm going to tweak the values on the script to make his movement better. And in Unity, you can get into this really nice flow where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm manipulating stuff in 3D space. I'm writing a little tiny bit of code and I'm tweaking it. Whereas before that flow would be interrupted by, I have to write the code and send it to the compiler, all these distinct steps. Um, so I'm hoping that eventually making games would be more like painting, less like building a house, uh, more like jamming in a garage band, you, like feeling like you can improvise while you're working on stuff, not like you're having to lock down and write like a 100 page design document. Um, and this also involves the concept of play. There's the idea of playing games, but there's also the idea of being playful. Um, children play all the time, that's their natural state. They love to break things and throw things around because they're curious. And I think that this is something we should be doing. If we're creative people, we should be, we should be playful. We should be not just making games, thinking about the profit that we want to make from them so we can stay alive, but also just what's fun, what's interesting, what's going to be different. Um, and I think all of this will be kind of happening once we have the right tools and we're not really there yet. We're not at the point where we can like go into Unity and open up a scene and collaborate with 10 different people around the world at the same time. There's not really a tool like that yet. But Unity is definitely a step in the right direction. I think it's the best tool available to sort of go in that direction. Um, but now we're going to go down back to Earth and depressing, boring reality. Uh, and it's still pretty exciting, so <laughs> uh, I'd like to help you get familiar with Unity's UI. Um, so hopefully you have this project open. Now I'm just going to sort of go through a few basic things. Um, my screen might look different from yours because I have the pro version and you might have the free version. The free version is white, who cares, whatever. Um, and the layout here might be a bit different. So what I'm using over here, I'm using up here if you click you get a whole bunch of different layout options. And I personally think 2x3 is one of the best ones. And if you want to switch to that, unfortunately 2x3 on my screen looks really weird because I don't have enough screen space. So like my scene view there is like 10 pixels wide or something. So what, what you can do here is you can actually drag all these panels around by their tabs. So you can move these things around. You can customize this however you want. So I just dragged this one down here so that I have my project view and hierarchy in the same thing um, so I know where they are and I can see them on the screen at the same time. Okay. And we have a whole bunch of different uh, panels that do different things. And the most important one right off the bat is the scene view. So if you click on the scene view, you can scroll around using your scroll wheel. On, I'm on a MacBook Air, so I'm using two fingers to scroll around. On your sheet here, on the second page, there's some information about how to move the view. Notice up at the top left here, you have four different tools, right? Those, there's like a hand and like a compass thing and a rotating thing. Um, one of the best shortcut keys for getting stuff done quickly is, are, are the Q, W, E, and R keys. If you just hit those, if, you have to make sure caps lock is off and you have to make sure that you've clicked in the scene view. You can just cycle through all these different tools really quickly. That's kind of important because what you're going to do is you're going to be, okay, I want to switch to this tool. This is the translate tool. And translate sounds like crazy, but it really just means move. Um, and you can drag these things around by their handles when you're in the translate mode. Then you can switch to the rotate mode, rotate stuff. You switch to the scale mode, scale stuff. So if you're using the keyboard shortcuts, you're going to be doing this way faster than me if you have to go up and click and go back and go up and click. 
still works with caps lock, or at least on my. Okay, for some reason on my computer it doesn't work with caps lock. Uh, so is everyone okay with that? Is everyone sort of following, or is anyone confused? Follow. Who <laughs> <laughs> wants to admit it? I'm always confused, but I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> um, I think you dropped a question. Yeah. Oh, okay, so do you have the project files? Okay, so if you, if you extract those somewhere, not, not Minecraft. <laughs> and well, the project won't run in Minecraft. Uh, yeah, if you extract that to somewhere on your hard drive, and then open the folder that gets extracted, would you mind putting it on the So can everyone move a block around? Is that, has everyone figured that out? Is anyone having a problem with it? Okay. Another really useful shortcut that you can use is uh, when you're in the scene view, you can click on things, right, to select them. Then you can hit F key, and the camera will warp to focus on the object that you've clicked. So this is a really easy way to move around the scene. So I can go over here to one of these other blocks and click them, right? I'm just going to maximize those records. <laughs> So if you kind of like fly around the scene a little bit, you can see that we've hidden a stash of different types of blocks off the side. <laughs> and these blocks are kind of cool. They're, we call them prototype blocks. And one of the reasons they're cool is basically you can build all kinds of different models using just these uh, 10 or 12 blocks. So uh, another really useful shortcut is uh, Control D or Command D if you're on a Mac. If you have an object selected, you can just hit that. And then now you have a clone, and you can just drag it around. If you hold Control or Command while you're dragging, you can snap to the grid. So you can just start grabbing these pieces, moving them around, and you can start to kind of build a level. So this is a pretty boring level right now. This thing over here. I'm just using an alt and I'm switching to the hand tool here to move around. I can just drag when, I'm in, when I have the hand tool selected. This thing over here is the objective of the level. You're going to play as a little ball that rolls around and you have to get to that goal. So one of the things I want you to try to do is build a level where the player the player's going to start right here and you have to make some kind of path that the player will follow to get to that. Uh, end goal. So here's an example. Here's a really boring example. I'm just hitting Command D and dragging while holding Command. And I just copy four blocks and he's goes straight to the exit. So it's probably not a very fun level. Uh, but you have all kinds of ramps. So for example, I could just take a ramp and clone it. Go over here. Rotate, you can rotate while holding uh, command or control as well. So you can just walk to 45 degrees. Is there a way to make that more granular? Or is it like stuck to whatever the, like the snapping? Like can you see yeah, from you, like half the unit? You can change on here, edit snap settings. If you want to customize, right? So here the grid for moving is set to 111. And scale 0.1 and rotation 15 actually, not 45 as I thought. So if you want to tweak that, you can, or you can also just rotate without holding down command if you want, like a really fine rotation. Yeah. <clears throat> These pieces are kind of neat because they're like uh, half pipes. So kind of like Tony Hawk, you can like duplicate some of these. And now one way you could build, like what I want to do here is just build like a bit of a half pipe, right? But instead of cloning one block at a time, I can hit shift and click. So now I have two blocks selected, right? So I just, I'll do that again. I just click this to select one of them, and then shift click, I'll select two, and then I can still duplicate Command D or Control D, and then I've got both of these going at the same time. You can drag select two. Yeah, so Tom just mentioned that you can drag select, so if you drag like this, you can select all of this different stuff at the same time. Uh, it depends kind of like how precise you want to be. Another thing I'll introduce right now that will help you hopefully figure out how to move around the scene is this thing up here. It's called the 
Seam Gizmo, or Seam View Gizmo. And if you tap these different arrows on the side, you'll flip to orthographic, so perfectly flat angle. So you'd be like, okay, I want like a top view. There, I instantly have a top view of my level. Um, this is really useful for, uh, for 2D games, but it's also useful for games like this when you want to, okay, I just want to like duplicate these, I don't care about seeing the perspective right now, so I'm just going to go here and do these and whatever. I can also just do this. It's easier to drag select now. This is kind of like when you're typing uh, on a keyboard and going Q, 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 and they just copy a bunch of the cues. <laughs> You don't do that? All right. <laughs> if you click in the center of that gizmo, it'll go back into perspective mode. So basically, once you're clicking these handles, you're going to these flat views. And clicking the center, you're going back to perspective so you can fly around and see everything. So this is kind of a weird level because it's like, you can just go to the exit, or you can check out this sweet half pipe that goes nowhere, <laughs> you just die. <laughs> so another thing that's going on here, by the way, um, this little thing in the corner, which is weird, but you can click that and you can maximize and minimize panels. So that's what I've been doing, I just maximize that scene uh, view panel there so I could actually see what I was doing. And you could also just right click on the tabs to get the same menu. All that stuff's also in your notes. There'll be a quiz in 15 minutes, so that's good. So another thing that's going on here, there's uh, this guy. Oh, I'll go back here. This object is called trigger fail because it triggers a failure. Um, and the failure is you falling out of the level. So this is kind of like from the side view of the level. You've got all your blocks here. And then down below, there's this green box. And once the player falls to that green box, that'll trigger a restart of the level. So it's just a really simple fail condition. Um, hello. Yeah, you slack it. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Joel Forrest. Sorry, how did you find the, the green box there? Yeah, so um, another view I, I'm going to oh, sorry. Yeah, so another thing that's important to know about. So we've sort of gone over how you can poke around the scene view to, to select objects, right? But another way to select objects is in this hierarchy view. And that just lists all the things that are in the scene. And you can actually search the hierarchy view. So here there's like a search field up here. If I was really confused about like, oh, where, you know, where's the trigger? I could just search for trigger and finds the trigger fail, right? But I can also go through these groups of objects that we've set up. So I'm just going to come around and see what you're doing. <laughs> I'm curious if there's anything happening. Okay, so there's a couple of things I've been seeing that I just want to help you guys out with, just so that, like, you know, what's up us. Um, if you're having problems with the grid, I saw some people having problems, like, where, I'll try to show you what's happening here. If they, uh, if you move a block without using snap to grid, right, like, say like that, and you leave it, and then you use snap to grid again to move it, now it's offset, right? It's not in the grid anymore. One way you can fix that, um, once you have an object selected, you can see over on the right, you get this whole inspector panel. And this gives you all this information about the object. And we can see where the offset is because this is the position values, right? So five, it's a whole number, it's on the grid. Zero, whole number on the grid. This is some weird decimal value. So you can actually just go in here, click this once, it'll select the whole field, and then you can just hit zero. And that guy's back on the grid. Um, so that's one way you can fix that stuff. You can also change the snap settings. I mentioned this before, but I think a few people missed it. You can go to the edit menu, and then right at the bottom, there's snap settings, and that lets you change the amount that things move. But for these blocks, uh, one by one by one should be OK. So I guess uh, give you like six more minutes to finish your level. 
And then at eight, we'll try building the player, and then you can actually roll around the level and see if it works. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to move on to the next step so you can actually try playing your level now. Um, it's not ready. It's not ready. If your level's not ready, that's okay. We can finish it later. Um, but I'm going to enter attention for this because it's kind of it's kind of confusing, but it's important because it's kind of the first step on your way to actually building your own stuff. You're not going to have to write any code. But you're going to kind of learn about how components work a little bit. Um, so all we're really going to do, we're going to snap together a bunch of pieces to build our player. Um, some, most of them are already built for you. And this is also on your sheet if you need help following along. Uh, building the player is the thing we're on. So you're already in the tutorial scene. We don't need to worry about that step. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is create a new sphere, and that's under the game object menu, create other sphere. And when you create objects this way, they'll be created in the center of the scene view, which is a little bit annoying sometimes because you might not know where that is, but that's okay. So we're going to make a sphere, right? There we go. And you'll see it's highlighted in your hierarchy view. And this is where we can actually go in really easily into the inspector and set its position to zero, 010, zero, which is our start position. So that was, I, I just went to the menu, I created a sphere, um, and then I didn't have to do anything, it was already selected, I just went over the inspector and changed those values. This might be a good time to save your scene, <laughs> in case you make some horrible mistake and want to undo it easily. Um, Okay, so if, if you all have a sphere, fingers crossed, uh, and you've moved it to zero, 010, zero, now we're going to rename it player. And if that was all that was required to make a game, there would be too many games. <laughs> uh, it's not that easy. Uh, so we have this sphere, it's just sitting there, it's not going to do anything. You can try playing the scene, and you can wish really hard, clap your red slippers together, but nothing's going to happen. I'm so sorry. Um, so the first thing we're going to add to this is a rigid body component. Sounds a lot more exciting than it really is. Um, so if you go to the component menu, you drop down to physics, and you just slide over to rigid body. This is while you still have your new player object selected. And remember, the player is just a sphere that we've renamed player. It's a sphere posing as a player. <laughs> And we're not fooled at all yet. Um, so now there's, okay, now you can select the player, right? We've got more stuff on the inspector. We've got a transform up there, which is the position. We've got a mesh filter. That's the sphere's actual mesh 3D data. We've got a sphere collider. That's what physics uses. We've got a renderer. That takes the mesh and renders it. And we just added this one, rigid body. And this is the physics component. Adding a rigid body to most regular primitives in Unity will make it physics-y automatically. Um, it's fantastic. So if you play, it's magic, if you play the scene right now, you can actually drag the ball around and it'll react with physics already. So just, whoops, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe be more gentle and just go, you know, and nudge it around the ball and roll around. So already we have a, a ball that's rolling around, but there's no way to control it yet. So there's one other component we have to add. Um, first, we're just going to tweak one parameter. Right here on the rigid body, it's connected to the player. We're going to change this drag value to 0.1. It doesn't seem like a very big change, but drag on a rigid body basically means it will, instead of it constantly accelerating as you give it force, it'll drag a bit on the surface. Um, without that, your ball will just kind of fly around. You don't want it. You don't want your balls flying around. <laughs> Speak from experience. Um, and then you just need to add the player component, which has been written for you already. Uh, and that's in the scripts folder in your project. So the project is different from your hierarchy view. The hierarchy is what's in your scene right now. The project is all the stuff that's available to you in your project. So there's a bunch of scripts and scenes and models and prefabs and things. 
We don't need to know how those work yet. We just need to find the scripts folder. Then we're going to just drag this player script. Now you can, you can either drag it over here to the inspector when you have the player selected, or you can drag it up here to the player, or you can even drag it into the scene view. Okay, so you, you can kind of work that however you feel most comfortable. Usually I like dragging over the inspector because it's like a bigger target to hit. Um, and there you go, there you have player script. And this has a bunch of parameters on it. And these are all parameters that if you, if, once you learn scripting, you can go into the script. I'll open it right now, just to show you what's in there. The, I've put tons of comments in here that explain what's going on. If you want to go read through that, we're not really going, going to explain that in depth right now. But these are all the parameters, and they magically show up here in Unity on this component. So ground move force, that's how fast the ball is going to move when it's on the ground. Ground move torque, torque is a rotational force. Air move force is zero, so that's like when you're not touching the ground, can the player move around, can the player influence the ball using the force. Gravity force will add some extra downwards force if you think that gravity is too low. This tweaks the overall gravity for everything. So gravity force is just, you can like reverse it if you want. Kurt might have done that. He's excited about something. Um, these toggle the force and the torque. So right now torque is disabled. And that's just because the ball behaves very differently if you're moving it just by, a force is like, pretend this is a ball. That's my mouse. <laughs> um, force would be like applying force like this. The ball's still gonna, gonna roll. Torque is like actually spinning it to make it move. So you can combine both of those if you want, or none, none will not do anything. Um, but you can kind of play around with that if you want. But if you run the scene now, and you click in the game window, you should be able to use the arrow keys or ASDW to move this guy around. And if you don't like the way he moves, you don't get to blame me, you can tweak the values. Now, I'm gonna try something very silly here and see what happens. I'm gonna multiply the move force by 10. Ah. So that's a little too fast, but you notice, I changed that value while I was playing the game. If you change values while you play the game, they'll be erased once you stop playing the game. And this is something that's, that people always forget when they use your view, myself included. But it's actually a really useful thing. You can play the game and try out different values and totally mess up these values and then stop playing and they'll all go back to normal. And then once you've figured out what values you want, you can enter them in once the scene is stopped. So if I wanted to make that change permanently, I could do it here now, then play the scene, then everything would be screwed up. Um, I can go back and undo it here. And there's some other goofy stuff you can mess around with if you want. You can go into the scale for the ball. You can change it to you know twice as big. Might have to move your guy up so he doesn't flip through the ground here. And then you can try that. See how that works. You can even get really ridiculous with it. It's <laughs> Katamari. <laughs> you could actually, we could turn this into Katamari. The cool thing about this prototype is we can kind of like, if you guys have any ideas of things you want to try out or add, um, we can do that in time for the next meeting and we can have like a new version of this available that has all these different weird gameplay things that you can toggle off and on. So we're talking about maybe adding like the ability to shoot blocks or something like that, maybe enemies that knock you around. And we can go through and explain those things. It will hopefully be a cool way to figure out a bunch of different neat game development strategies. And there's one more thing that we're going to do here because right now this is just a boring white sphere. And we actually have a 3D model in here. If you go into your project view, there's a models folder. Um, and there's this, this guy here. This is the icon for a model. It's this blue cube with a little file icon beside it. We're just going to drag that into our scene. We're not going to drag it onto anything. We just want to throw it into the scene, right? So OK, here it is. Somewhere it's down there. It's pink and too small. I haven't said that very often. Um, you drag the ball in the, uh, in, the pride, in the hierarchy, you want to drag it onto the player. And what that will do 
it'll parrot this object to the player. And we can see what that does right now. That basically means that its position is now relative to the player. So this is going to look really stupid, but you can see it moves as if it was sort of attached uh, to the player object. So what we're going to do here, we're going to go into the, the player. We're going to go turn off this mesh renderer because most of these components have these little check boxes right here. And this is really handy if you want to just turn off a component. You now, all your objects in the game are called game objects, and they all have a bunch of different components on them. That's all the stuff that we've been looking at are called components. <coughs> Sometimes they're scripts that you write yourself. Sometimes they're things that come with Unity, like a rigid body, or these renders. So we're just going to toggle this one off. That's going to turn off the default sphere renderer. So we can just click that over and over again to see what's happening. Okay, so there's like a mesh that's white, this white sphere, and we turn it off. There's still a green sphere there. That's this sphere collider. We need that still because that's what's actually going to collide with the world. And all we're going to do here with this ball, we're going to set its local position to 0, 0, 0. That's the center point of the player. Because remember, the position of the ball is now relative to the player. So 0 is the same position as the player. And we're just going to change the scale to, I think, 4.25, 4.25, 4.25. And now we've, we've essentially replaced the uh, sphere model that we had before with our own model. Now, it doesn't look very different yet, but what you could also do is put a character in there, like say, Wug. You could put Wug, he could have animations, he could like roll into a ball or something. You know, because we've got this model inside the player that we can control independently. Um, and one more thing we're going to do, we're just going to go into this materials folder in our project and drag the ball material onto the ball model in the scene. And now it actually looks like something. So now we've, we've essentially made it look like it's actually a game and not just like a prototype. Although I guess it's still kind of a prototype. So if you follow all those steps correctly, um, you should be able to roll around the level and get to the exit. Once you get to the exit, it'll fall into it, and it will just reload the current level. You can go select the goal object here. There's a goal script on it, a component, and you can change what level that it loads. So later on, we can actually set up all these things into a sequence. We could put all your levels together into like a game that can, goes from one level to the other. Um, so as a test here, I can put in the name of the scene that's in here, so I could type what into this goal low level thing. Run this. Now if I go into goal, it should load that scene, but it can't. And this is stupid. So to actually be able to load a level, it's not enough to just load it from the scenes folder. You need to actually add it to the build settings. That's in the file menu, build settings here. This is just like the scenes that are actually going to be in your final build. Because usually you have a bunch of test scenes that are full of junk, and you don't want those to go out in your final build. So they're not considered scenes that you can load. So you can just go in here and drag, not the scripts folder, but the scenes that you want. So say I want template and load. And you just close it. And now we should actually be able to load this one scene once we go in this. Thing. There we go. Um, so I guess I'll just come around and see if you had any problems with the player stuff. Um, the other scenes in the game already have the player built. So if you're totally, totally stuck, you can just load the one scene and the other levels in here. Um, but yeah, I'll just come around and see what you've been up to. And if your scene works, if you've got the player working and your level is sort of done, I think one thing that would be really cool to do is share it with somebody else in the room and get them to play it. Because this is another uh, important thing about game design. You have to let people play your terrible crap. <laughs> <laughs> and they will tell you how crappy it is. And then you'll feel really sad. But then hopefully you'll realize what you can improve. Um, so one thing that I think would be cool for this group is if we're brutally honest with each other. That's probably a scary idea, but I think that's probably the best way that we can all get better at what we're doing is for like, I don't like this level. 
or why don't you like me? Well, I hate when you get stuck at this point. And then you can think of a way, okay, well maybe I can like change this, or maybe I can try something else and run it by a few other people. One of the things that you'll notice is once you're doing playtesting, you'll get opinions that like contradict each other. So it's, it's not enough to just go to like 20 people and do everything they suggest. You kind of have to like creatively synthesize all of that information. So uh, yeah, finish your level and test it out with someone else. And if you have any problems, I think Devin and I will be walking around if you need me to help with some help. I think I broke something. Kurt broke it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty Wait, that's yeah. like what's in uh, order uh, is uh, instead uh, of doing projection uh, mapping, so you, like, you just work yourself. Unfortunately, we run out of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have to clear out by nine, um, and we've got lots of computers, so I guess we might have to start packing up now. But thanks for coming out, and hopefully we'll have another meeting sometime. <laughs> uh, we're probably going to set up something on the meetup group for a message board if you have any feedback about either the prototype or the meeting, or if you have ideas about things you want to, we could we could add stuff and explain it and. Or if there's topics that you're like really interested in and you want us to cover in future meetings, that'd be a great place to put them. Like <laughs> 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 it's not an entire meeting on that. Well, just lens layers. Yeah, that's what Just speaker yeah. 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 okay, Well, thanks for coming out. And I hope you all come back. So yeah, this is our contact information. That's my Twitter, my blog, my email, if you have any specific questions. Um, and now we are going to roll out over to the King's Head and have a drink and uh, talk about stuff.